Last Sunday evening, we introduced a sermon entitled The New Covenant. It's from Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verses 31 through 34. And I decided it might be too much sermon for one occasion, so basically introduced it. And introduced it by stating God's covenants that he gave in the Old Testament, or the recorded in the Old Testament. There was the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Israel, and the covenant with David. And we looked at these different covenants. And then we pointed out that there's also a fifth covenant mentioned, as it is in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And this is described as a new covenant. In the first 29 chapters of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is basically describing his task, or we have a description of his task, in telling the people of Judah that they need to repent. If they don't repent, there's consequences, and basically the consequences are coming because they are not going to repent. It's very evident of the attitude of the people, including the king, because a book is taken, uh, it's read before the king, and he just cuts it into shreds and puts it in the fire. Despite all the bad news in Jeremiah, there is some good news. Yes, punishment is coming. In fact, there will be 70 years of captivity. But there is the promise of something better. Uh, read with me from Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning with verse uh, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah says there's going to be a new covenant. Well, what would be so new and different about the covenant that Jeremiah speaks of? What would set it apart from the previous covenant? Jeremiah's prophecy outlines several important characteristics of the new covenant. First, it would come in the future. Behold, the days are coming. Jeremiah is not specific about the timing. He just says, it's coming. And it was typical of the Old Testament prophets to speak of the future in such an indefinite way. Expressions such as after those days and the latter days or simply then were commonly used in offering assurances to the people that God would once again act in their favor. Now, although Jeremiah gave no set time for the establishment of this new covenant, it naturally became associated in people's minds with the coming of the Messiah. When God's anointed one came, he would usher in the era of the new covenant. That was the thought. Secondly, this new covenant would reunite the tribes of Israel and Judah. Jeremiah specified that the new covenant would be with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, verse 31. Well, this promise is remarkable for two reasons. <clears throat> First, the nation had been divided for more than 300 years since just after Solomon's time. Secondly, the 10 tribes which made up Israel, the Northern Kingdom, no longer existed as political entities. These tribes had been conquered and dispersed by the Assyrians. Restoration would not be limited to the previous tribal and political order. Jeremiah had already suggested that the restored Israel would include all the nations Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. We read there, And when you have multiplied and been fruitful in the land in those days, declares the Lord, they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. 
it shall not be made again. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. And they shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall join the house of Israel, and together they shall come from the land to the north, to the land that I gave your fathers for a heritage. In this new covenant, there would be a worldwide aspect. Now, Jeremiah does not mention that in chapter 31, but he's, or he's talked about it in Jeremiah chapter 3. Third, this new covenant would reside in people's hearts. The old covenant had been based upon laws which set forth Israel's responsibilities toward God. Keeping those laws would make them the holy people God wanted them to be. Jeremiah said that in making the new covenant, God promised, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. There's a difference here. In other words, the new covenant would become a part of the people so that they would desire to do God's will from within. This concept of a heart religion is not an entirely new one in the Old Testament. However, I put that emphasis wrong. It's not a new concept in the Old Testament, however. Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Yes, they could have the religion internalized. They could love the Lord with all their heart. But they had not done that. God's people had not kept the old covenant in their hearts to the extent that God desired. But Jeremiah said that it would happen with the coming of the new covenant. For this new covenant would be known by all rather than having to be taught. This is a very interesting statement. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Now under the old covenant, the physical descendants of Abraham, uh, the Israelites, that is, as a nation, were God's covenant people. But each succeeding generation of Israelites had to be instructed in the ways of the Lord and taught to know him. However, under the new covenant, everyone involved in it would know the Lord as a prerequisite to being among the covenant people. In other words, in the new covenant, you won't be a part of that covenant unless you have already learned about it. And when you learn about it, then you're a part of the new covenant. Fifth, this new covenant would not be broken. In verse 32, Jeremiah says, Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, my covenant which they broke. The most memorable fact about the old covenant is that Israel repeatedly violated its terms. Although God upheld his part of the, covenant, of the agreement, they were often unfaithful to their part. Tragic disobedience began almost as soon as the covenant was established, according to Exodus 32, with the incident of the worshiping of the golden calf. Moses had just received the law from God. And while he's up on the mountain receiving the law, the Israelites say, we don't know what's happened to Moses. Make for us an image to worship. And Aaron did so. Well, these transgressions against the Old Covenant occurred repeatedly throughout the history of Israel. So much was this the case that when Stephen made his stirring speech in Acts chapter 7, surveying the history of Israel's failure to live up to their covenant with the Lord, he ended with a stinging indictment. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, 
whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. God was promising through Jeremiah that the new covenant would be different in that it would never be broken. Sixth, this new covenant would never end. Jeremiah followed his announcement of the coming of the new covenant with this promise. If this fixed order, the physical universe with its natural laws, departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. The permanence of the new covenant simply is not matched by the old. Once this covenant was established, there would never be the need for another. The greatest promise of the new covenant is found in the latter part of verse 34. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And then seventh, the new covenant would bring complete forgiveness. Perhaps the greatest promise of the new covenant is found in the latter part of verse 34. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. The promise of forgiveness was truly remarkable, considering all they had done in violation of God's law. Well, Jeremiah says a new covenant is coming. When was this covenant established? We're still faced with the fact that Jeremiah was very nonspecific about the timing of this new covenant. However, the New Testament writers were not. They unanimously asserted that the new covenant was established with Jesus' death on the cross. When Jesus ate the Last Supper with his disciples and instituted the Lord's Supper for subsequent followers to observe, he made specific reference to the fact that the new covenant would be established at his death. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And in the same way, he took the cup after he, they had eaten, saying, The cup which is poured out for you, this cup which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Now, numerous New Testament references confirm the fact that by the coming and death of Jesus, the new covenant was now established. All of the promises mentioned by Jeremiah have now been or are in the process of being fulfilled. The new covenant came in keeping with the prediction. Jesus came approximately 600 years after the time of Jeremiah, and he convincing, consciously saw himself as bringing in the new covenant. Luke chapter 22, verse 20, and other passages. Here we have the reading of the Messianic prediction. That's from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. Jesus reads that prophecy in the synagogue at Nazareth early in his ministry. And what does he say after he reads it? He says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Paul affirmed Jesus' fulfillment of the prophecy by writing in Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Clearly, it is the position of the New Testament that Christians today and since Jesus' death on the cross live in the new covenant era. The promises of Jeremiah 31 have become reality for us because of Jesus. Now the new covenant has brought about a restored people. Jeremiah predicted that in the restored Israel, all the nations would be gathered to God. The New Testament proclaims that believers in Jesus, both the Jew and Gentile, constitute a new Israel, the new covenant people of God. Paul explained, in Galatians chapter 6, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Peace and mercy be upon all who walk by this rule, upon the Israel of God. Romans 1.16 emphasizes that the gospel, the good news about Jesus, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul's letter to the Ephesians declares that in the cross of Christ, God broke down the barrier of the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles and made both groups into one. In other words, the new Israel is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. God has not restored Judah and Israel as political entities, but as part of the spiritual household of God, which also includes Gentile believers in Christ. We also see that this new covenant is written on people's hearts. Under the gospel of Christ, our motivation for doing what is right does not consist in the requirements of a collection of laws, but in the knowledge of a loving Savior whose sacrifice calls forth our best manner of living. Of course, that manner of living is set forth in the writings of the scriptures, so we still have laws. God has not simply given us a new law, that is, new commands. He has given us a new motivation, the cross of Christ, and a new power, the Holy Spirit, by which to live. The God of the new covenant is known by everyone who is a part of it. Now, the old covenant included the physical descendants of Abraham, that is, of Israel, of Jacob or Israel. Being born an Israelite did not automatically mean that one would be obedient to God. You were just kind of born into the family. <clears throat> it was a national covenant with a specific group of people. The new covenant, by contrast, is not national, but spiritual in nature. No one is a part of the new covenant unless he or she has believed in Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah, and has been incorporated into the covenant people through the voluntary act of baptism. Since faith is required in order to be a part of the covenant people, no one within the covenant needs to be taught to know the Lord. You have to be taught to know the Lord before you can become a part of that new covenant. Now this does not eliminate the need to teach those who are outside the covenant, of course. When you learn about the Lord, you can be part of, part of the new covenant. The new covenant will never be broken. We may wonder how it is that the new covenant of Christ can possibly fulfill the promise that it would never be broken. Of course, God will keep his part of the covenant. You can always count on God. He kept his part of the first covenant. But there is more to it than that. Can we claim that the new covenant is being kept perfectly by the church? Well, no. We're sinners. Saved by grace, we still sin. While individual believers may even choose to forsake the new covenant and no longer be a part of it, the covenant itself remains intact. The church is faithful to its covenant with Christ. Otherwise, it would not be the church. The new covenant will never end. The book of Hebrews, the New Testament writing which has the most to say about the, the new covenant, opens with these words. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. With the coming of Christ, we have entered the last days. That is the period of the final covenant arrangement that God will make. Jesus is God's last word, and anyone who finds salvation will do so through him. This covenant, this new covenant, will not be replaced by another. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, the only place in the New Testament for Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, is quoted in full, cites Jeremiah's prophecy to show that the old covenant was intended to end when he said, a new covenant, <clears throat> he has made the first obsolete. For whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. In 
contrast, the new covenant will last, it lasts forever. And the new covenant brings complete forgiveness. Although the sacrifices required under the old covenant enabled the Israelite people to maintain fellowship with their God, something was lacking in them. They did not have the power to remove sins once and for all. As a result, they had to be repeated continually. Rather than enabling one's sins to be remembered no more, as Jeremiah promised would be the case with the new covenant, the sacrifices were a continual reminder of those sins. The book of Hebrews explains that Jesus dying on the cross changed all of that. He provided a sacrifice that could do what the former sacrifices were never able to accomplish. But, after, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressors <clears throat> that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. This is from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. We have a similar statement in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. There is a difference in this new covenant in the means of obtaining forgiveness. It is through the death of Jesus Christ. It is through a one-time sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus. But what are the implications of the new covenant? Although Jeremiah did not spell out the implications of the new covenant, whose coming he prophesied, or proclaim. The New Testament does, especially the book of Hebrews. The change in covenants is often overlooked in interpreting the Bible today. And when it is overlooked, much misunderstanding can result. Here are some implications of the New Covenant that are clearly presented in the book of Hebrews. Because of Jesus, the old covenant priesthood has been abolished. Jesus is now our high priest, and we need no other. In fact, the New Testament teaches that the only the legitimate priesthood that now exists is that of Christ himself. As Christians, we ourselves are referred to as a royal priesthood and are sometimes called the priesthood of all believers. Because of Christ's intercession, we no longer require the services of human intercessors. As Paul maintained in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There he says, For there is one God and one mediator, also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Secondly, because of Jesus, the old covenant place of worship has been replaced. Worship through Christ does not have to be done in any particular place. While the tabernacle, Israel's portable sanctuary in the wilderness, and the temple in Jerusalem were the focal points of the Israelite sacrificial system, the Christian faith is not centered in any geographical location. Rather, it exists in the hearts of those who trust and obey Christ. Christians can worship him anywhere and everywhere. Because of Christ, the old covenant sacrifices are no longer valid. The deficiencies of temporal sacrifices have been remedied by the perfect once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus. How could the old ones possibly have any validity now that the Lamb of God has been sacrificed for the sins of the world? And because of Christ, the new covenant scriptures must take precedence over those of the old covenant. While this principle is not explicitly stated in Hebrews, it is definitely implied. The very fact that the New Testament, when <clears throat> the very fact that the New Testament writers explain the true meaning, significance, and fulfillment of what was foreshadowed in the Old Testament 
shows that we must pay close attention to them. These inspired explanations are helpful for us, not only in understanding the New Testament, but especially in interpreting the Old Testament properly. We can understand the Old Covenant only by reading it through the lens of the New Covenant. Now God's revelation of his will has been progressive. He has gradually unfolded his plans and goals for his creation. Likewise, the written revelation found within the Bible has been progressive. This means that some things which were very important in the Old Testament, such as the priesthood and the sacrificial system, must be reevaluated in light of the coming of Christ and not simply be adopted by Christians. This by no means suggests that they have no importance because the New Testament tells us that the things written in the Old Testament were written for our instruction, Romans 15, 4. We can learn much by studying them, and they continue to be for us the Word of God. They must be interpreted in the light of the coming of God's Messiah, Jesus, which is what we find being done in the New Testament. The Old Covenant was indeed a wonderful gift of God to his people Israel. It was a gracious and merciful act on his part to invite them into a covenant relationship with himself. How sad it is that they failed to live up to the high calling which he had given to them. Because God is gracious and merciful, he was willing, unwilling, he was unwilling to leave his people in that state. He promised a new covenant and brought it into being through the sacrifice of his own son. Christians now have both the privilege and the challenge of being faithful to our God through the covenant which he has so graciously given to us.